Section 1. Why Darkest England? This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. This summer the attention of the civilized world has been arrested by the story which Mr. Stanley has told of Darkest Africa and his journeyings across the heart of the lost continent. In all that spirited narrative of heroic endeavor, nothing has so much impressed the imagination as his description of the immense forest which offered an almost impenetrable barrier to his advance. The intrepid explorer, in his own phrase, marched, tore, ploughed, and cut his way for one hundred and sixty days through this inner womb of the true tropical forest. The mind of man, with difficulty, endeavors to realize this immensity of wooded wilderness, covering a territory half as large again as the whole of France, where the rays of the sun never penetrate, where, in the dark, dank air filled with the steam of the heated morass, human beings, dwarfed into pygmies and brutalized into cannibals, lurk and live and die. Mr. Stanley vainly endeavors to bring home to us the full horror of that awful gloom. He says, Take a thick Scottish copse, dripping with rain. Imagine this to be mere undergrowth nourished under the impenetrable shade of ancient trees ranging from 100 to 180 feet high, briars and thorns abundant, lazy creeks meandering through the depths of the jungle, and sometimes a deep affluent of a great river. Imagine this forest and jungle in all stages of decay and growth, rain pattering on you every other day of the year, an impure atmosphere with its dread consequences, fever and dysentery, gloom throughout the day and darkness almost palpable throughout the night. And then, if you can... Imagine such a forest extending the entire distance from Plymouth to Petershead. You will have a fair idea of some of the inconveniences endured by us in the Congo forest. The denizens of this region are filled with the conviction that the forest is endless, interminable. In vain did Mr. Stanley and his companions endeavor to convince them that outside the dreary wood were to be found sunlight pasturage, and peaceful meadows. They replied in a manner that seemed to imply that we must be strange creatures to suppose that it would be possible for any world to exist save their illimitable forest. No, they replied, shaking their heads compassionately and pitying our absurd questions, all like this. And they moved their hands sweepingly to illustrate that the world was all alike, nothing but trees, trees, and trees, great trees rising as high as an arrow shot to the sky, lifting their crowns, intertwining their branches, pressing and crowding one against the other until neither the sunbeam nor shaft of light can penetrate it. We entered the forest, said Mr. Stanley, with confidence, forty pioneers in front with axes and billhooks to clear a path through the obstructions, praying that God and good fortune would lead us. But, before the conviction of the forest dwellers that the forest was without end, hope faded out of the hearts of the natives of Stanley's company. The men became sodden with despair. Preaching was useless to move their brooding sullenness, their morbid gloom. The little religion they knew was nothing more than legendary lore, and in their memories there dimly floated a story of a land which grew darker and darker as one traveled toward the end of the earth, and drew nearer to the place where a great serpent lay supine and coiled round the whole world. Ah, then the ancients must have referred to this, where the light is so ghastly and the woods are endless, and are so still and solemn and gray, to this oppressive loneliness amid so much life, which is so chilling to the poor distressed heart. And the horror grew darker with their fancies. The cold of early morning, 
the comfortless gray of dawn, the dead white mist, the ever-dripping tears of the dew, the deluging rains, the appalling thunderbursts and the echoes, and the wonderful play of the dazzling lightning. And when the night comes with its thick, palpable darkness, and they lie huddled in their damp little huts, and they hear the tempest overhead, and the howling of the wild winds, the grinding and groaning of the storm-tossed trees, and the dread sounds of the falling giants, and the shock of the trembling earth which sends their hearts with fitful leaps into their throats, and the roaring and rushing as of a mad, overwhelming sea. Oh, then the horror is intensified. When the march has begun once again and the files are slowly moving through the woods, they renew their morbid broodings and ask themselves, How long is this to last? Is the joy of life to end thus? Must we jog on day after day in this cheerless gloom and this joyless duskiness until we stagger and fall and rot among the toads? Then they disappear into the woods by twos and threes and sixes, and after the caravan has passed they return by the trail, some to reach Yambaya and upset the young officers with their tales of woe and war, some to fall sobbing under a spear thrust, some to wander and stray in the dark mazes of the woods, hopelessly lost, and some to be carved for the cannibal feast. And those who remain compelled to it by fears of greater danger mechanically march on, a prey to dread and weakness. That is the forest. But what of its denizens? They are comparatively few. Only some hundreds of thousands living in small tribes from ten to thirty miles apart, scattered over an area on which ten thousand million trees put out the sun from a region four times as wide as Great Britain. Of these pygmies there are two kinds. One, a very degraded specimen with ferret-like eyes, close-set nose, more nearly approaching the baboon than was supposed to be possible, but very human. The other, very handsome, with frank, open, innocent features, very prepossessing. They are quick and intelligent, capable of deep affection and gratitude, showing remarkable industry and patience. A pygmy boy of eighteen worked with consuming zeal. Time with him was too precious to waste in talk. His mind seemed ever concentrated on work. Mr. Stanley said, When I once stopped him to ask him his name, his face seemed to say, Please don't stop me, I must finish my task. All alike, the baboon variety and the handsome innocents, are cannibals. They are possessed with a perfect mania for meat. We were obliged to bury our dead in the river lest the bodies should be exhumed and eaten, even when they had died from smallpox. Upon the pygmies and all the dwellers of the forest has descended a devastating visitation in the shape of the ivory raiders of civilization. The race that wrote the Arabian Nights, built Baghdad and Granada, and invented algebra, sends forth men with the hunger for gold in their hearts and Enfield muskets in their hands to plunder and to slay. They exploit the domestic affections of the forest dwellers in order to strip them of all they possess in the world. That has been going on for years. It is going on today. It has come to be regarded as the natural and normal law of existence. Of the religion of these hunted pygmies, Mr. Stanley tells us nothing, perhaps because there is nothing to tell. But an earlier traveler, Dr. Kraft, says that one of these tribes, by name Doko, had some notion of a supreme being, to whom, under the name of Yur, they sometimes addressed prayers in moments of sadness or terror. In these prayers they say, O Yur, if thou dost really exist, why dost thou let us be slaves? We ask not for food or clothing, for we live on snakes, ants, and mice. 
Thou hast made us. Wherefore dost thou let us be trodden down? It is a terrible picture, and one that has engraved itself deep on the heart of civilization. But while brooding over the awful presentation of life as it exists in the vast African forest, it seemed to me only too vivid a picture of many parts of our own land. As there is a darkest Africa, is there not also a darkest England? Civilization, which can breed its own barbarians, does it not also breed its own pygmies? May we not find a parallel at our own doors, and discover within a stone's throw of our cathedrals and palaces similar horrors to those which Stanley has found existing in the great equatorial forest? The more the mind dwells upon the subject, the closer the analogy appears. The ivory raiders who brutally traffic in the unfortunate denizens of the forest glades, what are they but the publicans who flourish on the weakness of our poor? The two tribes of savages, the human baboon and the handsome dwarf, who will not speak lest it impede him in his task, may be accepted as the two varieties who are continually present with us, the vicious, lazy lout and the toiling slave. They, too, have lost all faith of life being other than it is, and has been. As in Africa, it is all trees, 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 with no other world conceivable. So it is here. It is all vice and poverty and crime. To many the world is all slum, with the workhouse as an intermediate purgatory before the grave. And just as Mr. Stanley's Zanzibaris lost faith and could only be induced to plod on in brooding sullenness of dull despair, so the most of our social reformers, no matter how cheerily they may have started off, with forty pioneers swinging blithely their axes as they forced their way into the wood, soon become depressed and despairing. Who can battle against the ten thousand million trees? Who can hope to make headway against the innumerable adverse conditions which doom the dweller in darkest England to eternal and immutable misery? What wonder is it that many of the warmest hearts and enthusiastic workers feel disposed to repeat the lament of the old English chronicler, who, speaking of the evil days which fell upon our forefathers in the reign of Stephen, said, it seemed to them as if God and his saints were dead. An analogy is as good as a suggestion. It becomes wearisome when it is pressed too far. But before leaving it, think for a moment how close the parallel is, and how strange it is that so much interest should be excited by a narrative of human squalor and human heroism in a distant continent while greater squalor and heroism not less magnificent may be observed at our very doors. The equatorial forest traversed by Stanley resembles that darkest England of which I have to speak. Alike in its vast extent, both stretch in Stanley's phrase, as far as from Plymouth to Peterhead. Its monotonous darkness, its malaria and its gloom, its dwarfish, dehumanized inhabitants, the slavery to which they are subjected, their privations and their misery, that which sickens the stoutest heart and causes many of our bravest and best to fold their hands in despair, is the apparent impossibility of doing more than merely to peck at the outside of the endless tangle of monotonous undergrowth, to let light into it to make a road clear through it that shall not be immediately choked up by the ooze of the morass and the luxuriant parasitical growth of the forest. Who dare hope for that? At present, alas, it would seem as though no one dares even to hope. It is the great slough of despond of our time. And what a slough it is no man can gauge who has not waded therein, as some of us have done, up to the very neck for long years. Talk about Dante's hell, and all the horrors and cruelties of the torture chamber of the lost. 
the man who walks with open eyes and with bleeding heart through the shambles of our civilization needs no such fantastic images of the poet to teach him horror. Often and often when I have seen the young and the poor and the helpless go down before my eyes into the morass, trampled underfoot by beasts of prey in human shape that haunt these regions, it seemed as if God were no longer in his world, but that in his stead reigned a fiend, merciless as hell, ruthless as the grave. Hard it is, no doubt, to read in Stanley's pages of the slave traders coldly arranging for the surprise of a village, the capture of the inhabitants, the massacre of those who resist, and the violation of all the women. But the stony streets of London, if they could speak, would tell of tragedies as awful, of ruin as complete, of ravishments as horrible, as if it were in Central Africa. Only the ghastly devastation is covered, corpse-like, with the artificialities and hypocrisies of modern civilization. The lot of a negress in the equatorial forest is not, perhaps, a very happy one. But is it so very much worse than that of many a pretty orphan girl in our Christian capital? We talk about the brutalities of the Dark Ages, and we profess to shudder as we read in books of the shameful exaction of the rights of feudal superior. And yet here, beneath our very eyes, in our theaters, in our restaurants, and in many other places, unspeakable though it be but to name it, the same hideous abuse flourishes unchecked. A young penniless girl, if she be pretty, is often hunted from pillar to post by her employers confronted always by the alternative, starve or sin. And when once the poor girl has consented to buy the right to earn her living by the sacrifice of her virtue, then she is treated as a slave and an outcast by the very men who have ruined her. Her word becomes unbelievable, her life an ignominy, and she is swept downward ever downward into the bottomless perdition of prostitution. But there, even in the lowest depths, excommunicated by humanity and outcast from God, she is far nearer the pitying heart of the one true Savior than all the men who forced her down. I and then all the Pharisees and scribes who stand silently by while these fiendish wrongs are perpetrated before their very eyes. The blood boils with impotent rage at the sight of these enormities, callously inflicted and silently borne by these miserable victims. Nor is it only women who are the victims, although their fate is the most tragic. Those firms which reduce sweating to a fine art who systematically and deliberately defraud the workman of his pay, who grind at the faces of the poor, and who rob the widow and the orphan, and who, for a pretense, make great professions of public spirit and philanthropy. These men nowadays are sent to Parliament to make laws for the people. The old prophets sent them to hell, but we have changed all that. They send their victims to hell and are rewarded by all that wealth can do to make their lives comfortable. Read the House of Lords report on the sweating system and ask if any African slave system, making due allowance for the superior civilization and therefore sensitiveness of the victims, reveals more misery. Darkest England, like darkest Africa, reeks with malaria. The foul and fetid breath of our slums is almost as poisonous as that of the African swamp. Fever is almost as chronic there as on the equator. Every year thousands of children are killed off by what is called defects of our sanitary system. They are, in reality, starved and poisoned, and all that can be said is that in many cases it is better for them that they were taken away from the trouble to come. Just as in darkest Africa, it is only a part of the evil and misery that comes from the superior race 
who invade the forest to enslave and massacre its miserable inhabitants. So with us, much of the misery of those whose lot we are considering arises from their own habits. Drunkenness and all manner of uncleanness, moral and physical, abound. Have you ever watched by the bedside of a man in delirium tremens? Multiply the sufferings of that one drunkard by the hundred thousand, and you have some idea of what scenes are being witnessed in all our great cities at this moment. As in Africa, streams intersect the forest in every direction, so the gin shop stands at every corner with its river of the water of death flowing seventeen hours out of the twenty-four for the destruction of the people. A population sodden with drink, steeped in vice, eaten up by every social and physical malady. These are the denizens of darkest England, amidst whom my life has been spent, and to whose rescue I would now summon all that is best in the manhood and womanhood of our land. But this book is no mere lamentation of despair. For darkest England, as for darkest Africa, there is a light beyond. I think I see my way out, a way by which these wretched ones may escape from the gloom of their miserable existence into a higher and happier life. Long wandering in the forest of the shadow of death at outdoors has familiarized me with its horrors. But while the realization is a vigorous spur to action, it has never been so oppressive as to extinguish hope. Mr. Stanley never succumbed to the terrors which oppressed his followers. He had lived in a larger life. He knew that the forest, though long, was not interminable. Every step forward brought him nearer his destined jail, nearer to the light of the sun, the clear sky, the rolling uplands of the grazing land. Therefore he did not despair. The equatorial forest was, after all, a mere corner of one quarter of the world. In the knowledge of the light outside, in the confidence begotten by past experience of successful endeavor, he pressed forward. And when the hundred sixty days struggle was over, he and his men came out into a pleasant place where the land smiled with peace and plenty, and their hardships and hunger were forgotten in the joy of a great deliverance. So I venture to believe it will be with us, but the end is not yet. We are still in the depths of the depressing gloom. It is in no spirit of lightheartedness that this book is sent forth into the world as if it was written some ten years ago. If this were the first time that this wail of hopeless misery had sounded on our ears, the matter would have been less serious. It is because we have heard it so often that the case is so desperate. The exceeding bitter cry of the disinherited has become to be as familiar in the ears of men as the dull roar of the streets or as the moaning of the wind through the trees. And so it rises unceasing, year in and year out, and we are too busy or too idle, too indifferent or too selfish to spare it a thought. Only now and then, on rare occasions, when some clear voice is heard giving more articulate utterance to the miseries of the miserable men, do we pause in the regular routine of our daily duties and shudder as we realize for one brief moment what life means to the inmates of the slums. But one of the grimmest social problems of our time should be sternly faced, not with a view to the generation of profitless emotion, but with a view to its solution. Is it not time? There is, it is true, an audacity in the mere suggestion that the problem is not insoluble. That is enough to take away the breath. But can nothing be done? If, after full and exhaustive consideration, we come to the deliberate conclusion that nothing can be done, and that it is the inevitable and inexorable destiny of thousands of Englishmen to be brutalized into worse than beasts by the condition of their environment, so be it. But if, on the contrary, we are unable to believe that this awful slough, 
which engulfs the manhood and womanhood of generation after generation, is incapable of removal, and if the heart and intellect of mankind alike revolt against the fatalism of despair, then indeed it is time and high time that the question were faced in no mere dilettante spirit, but with a resolute determination to make an end of the crying scandal of our age. What a satire it is upon our Christianity and our civilization that the existence of these colonies of heathens and savages in the heart of our capital should attract so little attention. It is no better than a ghastly mockery. Theologians might use a stronger word, to call by the name of one who came to seek and to save that which was lost, those churches which in the midst of lost multitudes either sleep in apathy or display a fitful interest in a chasuble. Why all this apparatus of temples and meeting-houses to save men from perdition in a world which is to come, while never a helping hand is stretched out to save them from the inferno of their present life? Is it not time that, forgetting for a moment their wranglings about the infinitely little or infinitely obscure, they should concentrate all their energies on a united effort to break this terrible perpetuity of perdition, and to rescue some, at least, of those for whom they profess to believe their founder came to die? Before venturing to define the remedy, I begin by describing the malady. But even when presenting the dreary picture of our social ills, and describing the difficulties which confront us, I speak not in despondency, but in hope. I know in whom I have believed. I know, therefore do I speak. Darker England is but a fractional part of greater England. There is wealth enough abundantly to minister to its social regeneration, so far as wealth can if there be but hard enough to set about the work in earnest. And I hope and believe that the heart will not be lacking when once the problem is manfully faced, and the method of its solution plainly pointed out. End of section 1. Recording by Tom Hirsch.